Hey there, you're watching the Aussie Beam Guru and you've reached lesson three of my series about learning Dynamo. So today uh, we're on lesson three. Uh, we've had three so far. So the first one we looked at just about the series. After that, we looked at the user interface, then some basic arithmetic and data flow and logic. But today we're gonna be looking at strings and some other lesser used data types before we move on to list management. Okay, so we're looking at strings. Um, so for those that don't know what strings are, um, we're not talking about this sort of string. Uh, we're talking about this sort of string. So in coding, a string is basically a piece of text or anything that can contain numbers or letters. So you can see here, for example, a word is a string, a sentence is as well. Strings can contain numbers or they can just be numbers. So everything you see there is a string. So the data type is really what matters here. So we need to process the data as a string. So for example, if I processed one, two, three as a number, it wouldn't treat it like a string. And I'll show you that shortly. Okay, so we'll go straight to Dynamo just to show some examples of how to use strings. So uh, here's an example of a string node. So typically strings are located under input basic, um, or you can right click and search for a string. And all you have to do is type in your string. Um, it can begin with spaces or end with spaces or it can just be a space. Um, and you can see just different types of strings allowed here. So numbers um, and integers as well in the form of a string or a piece of text. So we're first gonna look at how to generate a range of strings. Um, so if you saw my last tutorial, it's very similar to creating a range of numbers, uh, but instead of using numbers, you use letters instead. So you can see here, I'm going from A to E with a step of one. So if I did a step of two, you'll see that I'll go instead like that. Uh, but in this case, this is how you can create a sequence. So we could do 26 letters and you'd, in principle, sorry, 25 letters. And in principle, uh, sorry, step of one and Z, and you get the alphabet. So that would be an example of how you could uh, manage that. But I'll just go to A to E, just to save some room. You can also do a sequence as well. So how many things do you want and your steps? So I could do 26 steps from A, and I would get the alphabet as well. So that can be quite helpful when you're trying to build a list of letters in a particular order. Um, also, you could step by two to get a alternating sequence as well. So very similar to numbers in that regard. We're gonna look at how to generate strings from other data types. So sometimes you might need to generate text. Um, an example of this is when you're processing data through into Excel and you might need text instead of numbers, even though you are working in the form of numbers. So in this case, you can see we have a sequence of numbers. Um, we'll run through code blocks a bit later on, um, but it's basically a more condensed way of building a, a range, depending on the syntax that you use. Um, so you can see that we're using string from array and string from object. So string from array basically condenses it into a list format as a single piece of text. However, a uh, string from object will basically turn everything in the list into a string but maintain the list structure. So you can see here that I've ended up with 10 items from my range, because my range originally was like that. And these may look the same, but they're not the same. So you can see here, if I take this range and I multiply everything by two, I get a valid list. Um, however, if I try to multiply my strings by two, it's not a string. So I get a list of nulls or I guess fails to find However, this is where you can use the string to number node. So sometimes you need to work the other way around. Sometimes you need to process your strings back into numbers. And if they are valid numbers, you'll be able to feed them through into this node. And again, these look the same, but they're actually numbers now. So if we did feed this through here, we should get a valid list of inputs as a result. However, if we feed our strings in, it doesn't work. So that's where data types can be quite important to understand feeding the right type of data to the right types of nodes. Okay, so we're gonna look at combining strings very briefly as well. So this is very common. Um, there's two ways to combine. One is called concatenate, one is called join. So concatenate is quite simple. It will basically just take a whole list of strings and it will just merge them into one. And obviously this isn't usually that desirable because you can see here that there's no spaces. So that's where join can be more important. So join is the same as concatenate, except you can add a character between each successive word or string that you're adding together. So you can see here that I've got a, a successful sentence. We could also go one, two, three, and comma. And you'll see the, the sequence that we get as a string, as a result. And you can also use the plus function uh, to combine strings as well. So the plus function pretty much works the same way as concatenate. 
Um, you'll recall that this can be used also using number using numbers as well. So this is just a little secret function you can use if you want to save a few keyboard strokes. Um, you can also work with lists when you concatenate and join as well. So we're going to look at lists in more detail in the next session. So don't worry too much if this doesn't make perfect sense. But basically I've generated a range, uh, basically the alphabet. And if I feed that list in to a concatenate, it takes everything in that list and we'll merge it together. And likewise, if I feed it into a join with a character, it will separate each part of the list with that separator and build one element out of it. And you can see here that if you feed in multiples, it won't join them all together. It will basically work at each one individually. So you can see here that I've got the alphabet coming in one and another one I've just fed in a single number, which in this case just gives me one. And the other one I've fed in a numerical range, converted it into a string. And as a result, I end up with the same thing with commas. So that's just something to be mindful of in terms of how concatenate and join works. And they're quite uh, common nodes when you're processing text data to use. If anyone's used Excel, um, it's a very similar function to an Excel. Okay, we'll look at some quick log logic functions. So for those that don't recall the last session or haven't seen it, logic is basically true or false, um, or what we call Booleans. So in this case, you can see I've got a piece of text, hello world, and I'm saying, does it end with world? It does, um, so it's true. And likewise, does it start with hello? It does, so it's true. You can see at the moment I'm saying to ignore case. If I say don't ignore case, you'll see these both become false, because in this case, I'm calling out world with a capital and hello with a lower case. So it's always important to understand if case is relevant. Usually case isn't relevant in most cases, it just depends. Sorry, terrible pun. Um, didn't even mean to say it. So we've got a contains node as well. So this one's really helpful for figuring out if a piece of data is relevant to what you might be searching for. I use this one quite a lot. So you can see here we've built a list just of three names. Um, two of them have the word Smith in them. One has Smith on its own and one has Smith as a bigger word. So it's just a part of it. And you can see here that I'm just searching for that word I'm not ignoring case, and you can see that two of them are true, one of them is false. So basically, you get a correlating list uh, that you can align with the previous list. And we'll look at a way to process that data in our next tutorial. You can also use the equals node in order to find exact matches for strings. So you can see here that obviously this has to equal this, so it's true. And again, you can use that to find exact rather than contains. Um, we're going to look at how to inspect very briefly. So I've got a sentence as a string. So this is a sentence. So I'm basically finding all indexes of E. And you can see it returns all the numbers as the indexes in that list. So obviously index 11 would be this E here, then this, then this. This one is giving me the last index, which is 17. And that's what I'd expect based on this list here. Likewise, uh, my first index of 11 Similarly, um, you can see that that's correct as well based on this list of indexes. So these can be quite helpful to find out where something begins um, because you can also use more than just one letter. You can say, I want to know the first index of EN, for example. And obviously I only have two indexes of that and it will return the first index of the first letter of where that occurs. We can also get the length of a string as well. So I have 17 let characters in this string. And in this one, I'm saying how many times does is occur? Is occurs twice. Um, so you can see how to extrapolate that as well. You can also change case of text as well. So we're gonna look at how to modify text now. So you can see here, I've got my name and I wanna make it lowercase or uppercase. And it will either raise or lower the case for the entire word. Likewise, you can say uh, change case and you can just say whether it's upper or lower. So that's more handy when you might be processing data with a bit of control by the user and you can see where that's occurring. We've also got what's called padding. So this is where you can force text to be a certain length um, if it's too short. So you can see here, one of them pads on both sides, one pads on the front and one pads on the back. So in this case, I'm saying it has to equal 16 characters overall and I'm going to use exclamation mark as my padding character. And you can see that's sort of how that would work. I don't typically use padding unless I have a, a list of data of an inconsistent length that I need to align temporarily. Um, but it, it does have some use in data management. 
Uh, our next function is insert. Um, so this one I've decided to mix two functions just to show you an example. So I've got a sentence um, saying Superman is better than Batman. Uh, but I want to say that he's not. So instead of just saying the index, because I know that it happens to be that way, um, I'm going to make it so that it always finds the index of where is is. So I can add characters here and it should still find where this happens. I'm then taking that index and going to forward to be on the back of the word. And I'm going to add n uh, apostrophe t. And then you can see I'm feeding that index into the insert. And basically I'm inserting those letters after that index, which forms that sentence uh, regardless of what I say. Um, so that's how to sort of mix string functions as well. So you can see the power of being able to process data, very similar to Excel, if anyone's used uh, string functions in Excel. Um, searching and separating is also quite useful. So you can do find and replace, which is pretty, uh, pretty helpful. Um, you'll, you'll find that you use this one quite a lot when you're trying to force data to be a certain way. Um, and also you can split strings as well. So you can split a sentence by a space and get every word in a sentence, for example. You can also split by commas, tabs, lots of separators, um, which is quite common in data management, especially with files uh, such as comma separated value files where everything's broken by a comma. Um, likewise, you can remove as well. So I can say I want to remove the first eight characters of this word. And likewise, I could go and say, where's my first index of S and remove everything before S as well. Similar to how I just uh, used two functions before. And you can also say, I want to know what substring occurs at a certain position. So give me two characters at index two. And you can see as a result, I get these two characters here. So that can be a good way to find um, where a common data value occurs if you have a fixed data structure. Um, probably beyond that, we just need to look at quickly tr cleaning up strings. So a common issue with text is sometimes it may have spaces um, in front of it when you don't want it to. So there's an easy set of nodes you can use called tr trim that solve that. So you can either trim the front, the, the back, or both ends. In this case, you can see I've padded my text with a lot of spaces either side. And you can see there that that's how it breaks it up. Obviously, if you have a character part way through there, it will only clean up to that point. But even still, it's quite a helpful function. Okay, um, so that's all the, the string-based functions. Um, we'll be using some of them in a tutorial pretty shortly. Uh, probably in a list management tutorial, we'll use strings as well. Um, probably to process letters and numbers together, which is always a good example of how to manage lists. There's some lesser known or lesser used data types. One is location. I find this one isn't very helpful, um, but I have heard of some people using it occasionally. So it's basically under the input tab on the location. Uh, but the reason why it's not that useful is because you define everything about the location. So you say where the latitude and the longitude are, and you say what the name is. The only time I've seen this used before is when you feed a smarter location node into this node to form um, location data. Uh, but it's very rare that this is very useful. So you can see there that I'm just building my location and then getting all those properties that I just put in out on the other side, um, which isn't very helpful. So that's why it's a lesser used one. Colors are more commonly used, um, but not uh, as commonly used as strings. So one really handy color node is a color palette where you can just pick a color or you can go advanced and give yourself sliders to pick from. So that can be really helpful when you're trying to override the color of an element in Revit, or if you're trying to override some geometry color in Dynamo, this is a really helpful node. You can also do things like divide the number to change its color so I can have half of all the values. Um, likewise, I can also multiply colors as well. And they always come out in the form of RGB and alpha. So how solid or transparent is the color? You can also do things like add colors together, but be mindful that you need to make sure their alphas never exceed 255 and that their RGBs never do as well. Otherwise it will fail to build a color. So keep that in mind, because if I do 255 here, it will fail to combine. Because their total alpha will be larger than what the, the maximum is, which is 255. But here I've managed to successfully build a color by adding them. So if I go to my watch node, you can also break colors into their respective components. So you can, you can isolate how blue, how green, how red, how transparent a color is. You can also get the components just using a simple node and you can also get the hue, saturation and brightness. So these are really helpful for processing color. So if you're processing image files 
this package is uh, quite helpful. Um, I find that I use that one quite a lot. And these are all located under display color. So keep these in mind when you're processing images, which Dynamo is actually quite good at doing, um, but not commonly used to do. You can also map things to color ranges. I won't go into detail on this because it can be quite complicated, but all you really need to do is uh, set a parameter range and set a color range using these inputs that we've shown before. Um, so have a play around with that if it interests you. Um, there's also time and dates in Dynamo as well. So time and date is stored under input and you've got date time or time span. I've only shown date time here because date time is quite simple. So usually the most common nodes for date time are what is the time now? So if I disconnect and reconnect that, it should give me the time. I believe that it holds onto the time uh, from the point you create the node or until you reopen the script. So keep that in mind. So I obviously made this uh, 21 minutes ago because it's 9.22 right now. Um, but you can see you can also take today, today's date time and you can say you want to watch it or you can say is it daylight savings time so it sources the data I believe from your computer um, and, and detects if it's daylight saving time depending where you are. You can also say what day of the week it is, what day of the year. Um, it can also just say the date time as well um, and also components so it can break down everything about the day for you. So it's quite a, quite a powerful set of nodes there. I find the most common thing I'll do that for is for stamping a date time on a file name when I'm creating a file using Dynamo to make sure that its file name is unique. Um, you've also got some nodes that I won't show you in too much detail because I don't use them very often, which deal with time spans instead. So how far between two times is there? So how many days, hours, minutes, seconds, etc. Um, these can be quite useful if you're running a script that relies on waiting for a certain amount of time between actions. Uh, otherwise, I don't tend to find a great deal of use for these functions. Um, but just be, just be aware that they are there because we've basically ran through all the types of data input that are native to Dynamo. Um, the remainder of the inputs we'll look at for this series overall will mostly relate to Revit itself, such as families and elements. Um, but we've covered the basic element types now. So there's more help available if you need it at the Dynamo Primer and also on the forums as well, um, keep in mind. But the next lesson we'll move on to after this one is how to manage lists. So this is where we get into much more data management and this is where you'll start seeing some more practical applications and examples for how to use Dynamo. Um, so I hope you join me on the next lesson and I hope you're enjoying them so far. Any comments, feel free to leave them down below. And if you enjoy what you're seeing and you're not subscribed already, feel free to subscribe to get all my, all my videos notified to you. And I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks. Take care. Bye.